Petit Computer was a DSiWare title released back in 2012 in North America. It was used for both software development and gaming. The app came pre-installed with five sample games and a handful of pre-built assets. But the real practical usage of PT Computer was the fact that anybody can write and code their own applications using its own custom version of BASIC. I'm not a programmer in the slightest, so the real reason I bought this title nearly a decade ago was because up-and-coming programmers would try to write and code their own games using this BASIC software. During its peak, there were programmers on the GameFAQ forums helping each other out code certain games that just weren't available at the time. PT Computer would unfortunately be removed from the eShop due to an exploit, but its replacement, Smile Basic, would come back on a 3DS, boasting more powerful features. Right now, Smile Basic 4 is also available on a Nintendo Switch, but for now I just wanted to focus on a DSiWare title. Back then, the modding and emulation scene still wasn't quite there for the 3DS, so many users would try to create fan-favorite games like Metroid and Mega Man. There'd also be DSiWare interpretation of popular games at the time, and a slow brew of homebrew titles where up-and-coming programmers would try something out and share with the masses before starting something anew. So I wanted to take a moment and share some of the games that were produced for this plucky little software. First off, all of this software is shared via QR codes. Small enough games may have one or two QR codes, or a small batch, but large programs required multiple packages that varied in size, with Mega Man and Mario Maker taking up a huge brunt of my time since they both took hundreds of QR codes to scan each. Also, due to the lack of compatibility with emulation for DSiWare and the lack of affordable capture cards for the 3DS available, I did have to use a camera to record footage, so sorry for the choppy work. First off, I wanted to share this fan-made interpretation of Five Nights at Freddy's. This one is contributed by Zalkayant. By the way, I'll probably will absolutely butcher names, and I'm sorry for that. We start off in an office and... Oh! I died already. Apparently it's a small glitch, but let's just start a new and try for reals now. It's kind of impressive actually. You use the D-pad up and down buttons to either light up or close the left side and the XB buttons respectively for the right. You do need to use the touchscreen to type in the camera you want to peek at, and it can make playing a bit cumbersome. But I do gotta say the sprites really work well, and the gameplay is functional, which is impressive to say the least. Next we have Chips Challenge, a petite computer remake of the same game released in 1989. This title was released by Mistman12. Honestly, it seems like a pretty solid remake, and while there's only a few actual levels, I can't say that this shows a lot of promise and would have been fun to have on a DSi. It had a lot of potential for a fun puzzle game with some upgrades programmed in, but sadly the creator didn't want any legal disputes, so they decided to cancel it. Next up is one of my favorite silly games, also created by Miss Man 12, Revenge of the Crazy Baby. I checked out the story and thought there were typos, only to realize that it was intentional to capture that early internet humor. Honestly, this reads like something Charlie Day would write in Sunny in Philadelphia. How is Salmonella the only word you spelled correctly? Anyways, this is one game that I couldn't actually beat. Some NES veterans might notice that this has assets from Contra, which includes the player's ability to roll up into a ball whenever they jump. But whenever it seemed like that was getting close, I'd lose all my lives. And sadly, this is not my video camera, and I'm on a time limit, so I couldn't beat the game in time. Next, we have Digimon V-Pet by Clavier141. I like this. You feed your Digimon when they're hungry, train their stats with cute animations, and tell them to go to sleep. With enough progress, you can watch them digivolve into different types. It's like a rapid-paced Tachigami. Apparently, there's instructions to upload your Digimon stats so they can actually battle with others, but sadly, by the time I tried this out, I didn't actually have the ability to look up QR codes, and there are a bunch of Digimon to select. I wanted to show off more of the roster, but again, I'm on a time limit, and I'll definitely be trying this out more at work, or waiting in a doctor's office for an appointment. Next, we have Don't Starve PTC. It's a joint project with Levy Seal Jar, Random Mouse Crab 98, and Sausage for the Win. At first, it shows promise. Nice open world, time and hunger meter in the upper right, and a crafting station. Beyond chopping trees though, I couldn't figure out what else to do. I wandered for a bit and reached a shore that seemed to go on forever. I double checked the wiki page after this to make sure I didn't miss anything, but all I saw were procrastination jokes by the creator. Ah uh, well. Next is Flappy Bird PTC Edition. This port was made by Blue Robin 2 and... Well, it's Flappy Bird, an almost exact recreation of the mobile game that reached hype levels for some reason. Not much to say really, it just works well and I have no complaints. The next title piqued my curiosity, Minecraft DS. It was a large project, and here you can see the credits for everybody who helped out this title. As much as I love to sing its praises, the game runs like frozen molasses. 
I hope I didn't do anything wrong while scanning the many QR codes to try this game out. I wasn't expecting full-on Minecraft, but the movement is incredibly wonky, and I only get two frames a second. I also needed to tap repeatedly to commit to any action. You're able to place blocks, and I think these bouncy things are slimes? There's a nice horizon in the distance and an obvious day and night cycle. Sadly, it's way too slow to do anything. I can only seem to break some of the blocks that you can place, and you can't actually activate the TNT block, at least I couldn't personally. Next up is another one of my favorite homebrew games, Village by Random Mousecraft 98 It's got a cutesy world generation and a load screen. You're able to explore a small village and collect various items to sell to buy different tools. You can decorate and plant seeds and even visit houses that host NPCs. You don't actually see them though, they just talk to you at the door. I was only able to get close to one that offers a Sudoku puzzle to pass the time, but I wasn't able to get close enough to the others in time for this video to see what else is there. I did play afterwards though and I gotta say the amount of varied bugs to collect, ores to dig, and fish to catch makes this pretty fun. I might do a follow up comment to add on additional findings for this title because it seems to have a bit more meat on it later on. Plus it's just got a lot of personality and charm. Next up is Smash PTC by Sparky Stream. Or B-Man as it says on a title screen, I'm not actually sure. Well, it's functional, I think. I'm pretty sure I missed a QR code or two. I tried to rescan everything before heading over to my friend's house, but still, it seems like I'm missing some files, so just take this footage with a grain of salt. It actually feels well to play, but there's only basic attacks as far as I can tell, and the only thing that the one AI NPC can do is just hover in close and not do much else. It's kind of a glitchy mess, so I'm not sure what else to say. Next up is this homebrew game that I have an attachment to, Tristones by Nimaj. Now this particular game seems to be created by a Japanese developer. I remember this was one of the earlier games I tried years ago, when it was purely in Japanese. I'm glad to see that it had a content update since then, and it added small bits of music that play randomly to add to its atmosphere. Honestly, it does play like a watered down Terraria, but it's inherently fun to me. You can kill enemies for loot or gold, head to the shop to buy equipment, and go out to explore and plunder various treasure chests. As you dig deeper, the enemies get tougher. The loot itself seems to be sporadic though. I remember the one time I found the best armor plate in the chest that was just in a second layer, out of five layers. You can throw bombs to travel down, but that consumes mana. And you can swing your sword to break through blocks, which also nets you XP. When you level up, you heal someone and gain a plus one to stats. But equipment gives you the larger boosts. Be careful though, there is fall damage, and dying makes you lose every piece of armor and weapon you find. Thankfully, you can buy accessories in the shop that don't go away, so you can double jump, walk on lava, tank falls better, get a backdash, replenish HP and mana naturally, and many more. I've played this game for hours. I don't have the footage, but afterwards I kept playing and reached a boss fight in the bottom right corner. It was like a snake boss, and I had a couple close calls, but thankfully I managed to defeat it, and I have this screenshot to prove it. Also, I'm the only one that probably did tweet about it, because if you look up that hashtag, you find my tweet from long ago. Next up is the second largest game I had to scan, Mario Maker PTC. This title was programmed by Bernie Von Bean, and man, it's basic, but fun. I only did some simple tests for this game, but with what little is available, you can still make some creative levels. There are a few glitches, and the controls aren't as tight as classic Mario, but the fact that it's available on DSi hardware, and that creating levels uses the convenient touchscreen, makes it worthwhile to scan if you ever plan to try out some games for this program. And now finally, what if I told you there exists a fan-made port on PT computer that somehow surpasses the original NES title? A timeless game that is coded to be played exactly the same, with almost no way to tell it's fan-made, programmed from the ground up. We get... Mega Man 2 for the petite computer by Disco Stew. It's legitimately the same. You slow down the same, you jump the same height, Buster and enemies have the same properties, exact boss fights, and it goes above and beyond. 
The stage select has added fun details for the bosses on the bottom screen. And not only that, you get boss rush mode, audio player, and even a functioning stage creator for you to mess around with. I wish there was more to get into, but it's freaking Mega Man. You beat the boss, you use their power-ups, and you use rush to skip through troublesome segments. Everything you know and loved access through hundreds of QR codes. But you know what? Scanning them was worth it in my opinion, and I'm sure others who got to experience the same would agree. Now I know a lot of people will probably think of what's the point of this. We're in 2022 already, and there are far better consoles, games, and digital platforms. But this is just like a nostalgia trip for me, something that has a personal history. Like back then, all I could afford was a DSi, so I obviously picked up a T-Computer because in my opinion, it was just a game that gave you access to other games at a smaller price. But it's just much more than that. This was not only good practice for up-and-coming programmers, but it gave people with limited funds like myself a chance to grow their library of games without having to overspend. I also wanted to make this video to preserve the works of these programmers as best as I can. Sort of like a thank you. I just can't imagine slaving away at the touchscreen, recreating something as amazing as Mario Maker or Mega Man 2, and just having all that work ripped away when Petite Computer was removed from the eShop. Yeah, sure, maybe it was inevitable with the legal headaches, but there were still the good homebrew titles that were removed with them, and it just feels like if nobody goes the extra mile to preserve them by talking about them, then they'll just fade into obscurity. And that just sucks in my opinion. Anyways, thank you for watching. See ya.